Okay, hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and uh, hopefully I am live. A little uh, um, strange um, what the issue is, but hopefully you're all seeing me live. And I don't know why, but it seems like I have a uh, um, a delay. I'm seeing myself what I, about five seconds delay. So I'll ask Lily to uh, email me if everything is okay, but I think it seems to be okay for me if I just ignore myself. So I'd like to welcome everybody. Today is October 8th, and I um, hope everyone's doing okay. And in, in terms of just several things, I think all of you got a newsletter from us, and I was involved with a CME course this past weekend, which made me think, should we do a CME course remotely this February? Remember, we've run 37 straight years of CT CME courses, always in Orlando. It used to be in Miami way back when. And this year, of course, with COVID, we're not going to have that opportunity. I know Disneyland is open, but we're not going. And most of you would not go as well. So the question is, President's Weekend, where we always have our meeting, should I run a two-day or one-day or three-day course? So uh, we sent out a, uh, a, a, a survey, actually, to everybody, which came with a monthly newsletter and it was also online. And I asked the questions, do you want to have the meeting? If you want, do you want CME credits? If you need CME credits, then I need to go through Hopkins, which means it needs to be a, uh, needs to be, people need to pay for it, you know, and we can have a very reasonable price, but you would need to pay uh, as opposed to most of what we do on CT is us, which is essentially all we do on CT is us, where um, everything is okay, but um, we don't give CME credit because CME credit has to go to a CME organization. There's a whole bunch of rules that need to be followed, including registration, counting hours. They have to report it. You have to report it. So it's not it's not hard for us to do, but it's something that we would do if people really want it. So uh, respond to our survey and uh, let me know uh, if if that's if that works. Um, so uh, so that's that's the practical thing. And then let's see, we got people signing in from all over the place, from the Sudan and from Mexico. Hi, everybody. And it is impressive, I think. Uh, you know, I, I'm always impressed. Uh, we have over 220 countries where people sign in different times. And it's just amazing. You know, you think about it, you always thought a big audience would be a few people from different places. And, uh, you know, um, now uh, it's everywhere and anywhere many different time zones obviously sudan probably is 12 hours difference i would guess mexico's probably three hours probably west coast time and yet it's a survey monkey just came up from lily so fill out that survey virtual meeting 2021 and so you're um what you think is what we try to do so it becomes very important you can see i'm home today i have a lot of work to do and i just had a few meetings and so i decided that since i've been working like every single day but i'm still working today but i would work from home you can see my pictures uh a lot of my toys. This, I see is the Donald Trump way back there. That was when he was with The Apprentice, not when he was president. Um, you know, it's that thing that says you're fired, right? We have a lot of those things and a bunch of other things. And uh, there's a lot of cool stuff in my office, um, which unfortunately you can't see because I can't turn the camera around 360 and let everything be shown. So that's just not going to work. So today's topic was on bladder CT. And I wanted to sort of divide the bladder into two different ways of thinking about things. So one thing, of course, is hematuria. So if you have a patient with hematuria, obviously we always think about the kidneys, we think about the ureters, we think about the causes ranging from stone disease to renal tumors to infection to trauma. And then we think about the bladder. Now, when we design our protocols, and you know this from past lectures and from what's on the website, we always look at the risk reward in designing protocols. So for example, if we do a hematuria patient, macroscopic hematuria, for example, and the patient's 75 years of age, on the arterial phase imaging, we will scan from the diaphragm to the symphysis. Because not only are we worried about the kidneys, but we worry about the bladder. Bladder cancer is a patient who are typically in their 60s and 70s. Bladder cancer is not uncommon. And what we've learned from doing a lot of uh, vascular studies like aortas is bladder tumors, particularly when they're small, show up really well. When you uh, have a bladder tumor, it enhances to about 80 or 90 Hounsfield units, which doesn't sound that much, but it's against urine, which is zero, and so it stands out really well. 
So we pick up many incidental bladder cancers in the eight millimeter to two centimeter range. In our incidentaloma talk, which I just redid a few weeks ago, I made the point that one of the most common incidentalomas is an incidental bladder cancer. And then in the past, ourselves and many other people have missed them because you're doing an aorta study, but you're not thinking about the bladder. Now we give patients a thousand cc's of water to drink before we do a contrast study to hydrate them. So then the bladder is distended, and so even the smallest of tumors are gonna be shown. So that indeed becomes very, very important. So when you're looking for hematuria, again, we're valuing the patient, we give them lots of water, the bladder is distended. So over age 40, typically we will do the bladder. If patients are under 40, the chance of someone having a bladder cancer is really small. So on the arterial phase, we're just going to scan through the kidneys. We're not going to scan through the bladder. On the excretory phase, when we want to see the ureters, we'll scan through the bladder. So that helps decrease the dose. That's the main reason we did it. Obviously, if dose wasn't an issue, you would scan everything from top to bottom. But contrast, radiation dose is an issue, so we don't do that. So important thing to remember, good bladder distension is critical for picking up small tumors. I see all the time when the bladder is not well distended, people will read the, read the scan as bladder wall thickened, advised cystoscopy, uh, can roll out tumor versus cystitis versus normal. That's a problem with an undistended bladder. You're not really sure what you're dealing with. So to me, a good bladder distension, which means have the patients drink a lot before the study, and our technologists encourage the patients not to go to the bathroom. If the bladder is empty or there's minimal urine in the bladder, it's very, very hard to pick up small bladder lesions, and it's very easy to overcall things. And I see that all the time. People just read, cannot rule out bladder tumor because of hematuria. And maybe that's true, but you know, I hate that, that can rule out, advise clinical uh, follow-up or evaluation. That's sometimes necessary, but it's not necessary in every case. And those two areas, bladder, and then the second area would be stomach, I, I particularly get annoyed about if the stomach is not distended, then you can't call the presence of tumor. And if it's not distended, you tend to read bladder, stomach is not distended, can't evaluate, or you read stomach looks thickened, but can't rule out that is lack of distension. Then you advise clinical correlation with endoscopy or repeat CT if clinically warranted. Now, the patient with abdominal pain, if you don't find the source, then clinically warranted might make some sense because perhaps the stomach is the source. I'd like to avoid having to do any of those cases, doing things over. So I think you need to get it right the first time. Getting it right the first time is really dependent on you having good opacification, good distension. The other thing in terms of bladder mass, and particularly small bladder masses, on excretory phase imaging, you will see a filling defect in the bladder, even if it's small, potentially. On the arterial phase, you're typically going to see an enhancing lesion standing out against the urine. So either way is easy, but again, as I mentioned with incidental lomas, make sure you're paying attention. But if you're doing bladder cancer, uh, make sure you're doing both, both of them. So again, we do def define things based on patient's age. Now, if you are staging bladder cancer, of course, we want to make certain we get a good look at the kidneys and the ureter. Remember, bladder cancer is a transitional cell carcinomas. A third of the patients at some time could develop another tumor. So you want to make sure you're not missing additional sites of disease. So you want to look at the kidneys, you want to look at the ureters, you want to look at the bladder. Same thing we turn around when we're looking at the kidney and we see a transitional cell. You want to look at the ureter, you want to look at the bladder. Now, of course, you know when you have a transitional cell of the kidneys, you're going to resect the kidney, the ureter, and part of the bladder because the concern is that something has seeded down and that becomes very, very important. So we look at things in that direction. So a, the other thing is when we're doing bladder cancer, just like if you're doing prostate cancer or you're doing GYN tumors, you got to think about the pelvis itself. So where does bladder cancer go? Most commonly, it's pelvic nodes and it's pelvic sidewall nodes. So you want to look very carefully. You want good opacification on the venous side to opacify the veins and the arteries. And then you look for the presence of nodes. Anything a centimeter or more, I'll consider abnormal. So you're looking at the pelvic sidewalls. You're looking at the obturator, the external iliac chains. You're looking high up at the aortic bifurcation. 
Of course, we'll also scan higher looking at the periodic regions. We'll also scan um, looking through the diaphragm. Bladder cancer, of course, can go to liver. Uh, again, metachronous tumors, be it kidney or ureter, we're we going to make sure we're not missing that. You want to look at the periodic zones up high by the pancreas. You want to look to the diaphragm. When you're staging bladder cancer, typically you also will get a lung CT because bladder cancer is one of the common GU tumors that goes to lung as well. So um, adenopathy is pretty uncommon. If you have bulky adenopathy, then typically you have a, 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 an advanced tumor, but lung metastases are not uncommon. So you want to look very carefully for the lung. So that's typically part of the protocol. Now, other things with the bladder, if, if people ask me the question, I'm worried about a fistula to the bladder. Now, the number one cause of fistula to the bladder is diverticulitis, diverticular disease. Um, you can get fistula from tumors. You can get a rectal cancer invading the bladder. You can get a bladder cancer invading the rectum. That's less common. You can get a GYN tumor, uh, vesicovaginal fistula, vesicouterine fistula with aggressive tumors that invade posteriorly. So the question is, how do you evaluate for the presence of a fistula? Now, if you give IV contrast and you hope for the fistula fill, you're going to miss most, most fistulae. We know this uh, for many reasons. In the trauma patient, looking at the bladder when you fill from above, you're going to miss a lot of bla uh, bladder injuries because you need to distend the bladder. So you do a CT cystogram. So when you want to look for a fistula from the bladder, there's two things you can do. One is a CT cystogram. Drip 500 cc's of contrast. Uh, it's basically 30 cc's of contrast and 500 cc's of saline uh, by gravity. Drip that into the bladder. The bladder gets distended. And if there's a fistulous tract, it commonly will opacify. The other way of doing it, and the way we wrote an article a million years ago about that maybe is the best way, put a rectal tube in and give rectal contrast. Again, the same type of solution. Give rectal contrast and look for a fistula from the rectum to the bladder. Now, either of those work well. I think the rectal one is a better one because it's easier to distend the rectum. It's a little bit uncomfortable for the patient, but it's not that big a deal. You need 500 cc's. You surely need no more than a liter, perhaps, but uh, in select cases. But that's very, very accurate at giving you good opacification of any fistulous tract. Um, it works out very nicely, particularly in patients with colon cancer, diverticular disease, and the like. Again, um, diverticulitis, we talk about a prodromal stage where there's a fistula or the bowel is really close to the bladder, but there's no direct fistula, but you know it's going to develop one. Remember, patients, once they have uh, uh, enterovesical fistula, colovesical fistula, high morbidity, high mortality. So if a patient has diverticular disease and the bladder is adherent and is thickening, you kind of almost can imagine the tracts developing, you would operate on that patient early before the fistula is present. You can have much better control. Once the fistula is present, you tend to run into more problems, and that can be problematic. So let's see. I have uh, a bunch of other comments from people. So now it's also a good time to have you have questions. So we've had people, we have people online, Philip Taylor from Stone Springs in Northern Virginia, and Lidiana, who's saying hi from Palo Alto, and Ahmad from Berlin, and Meg Fines from uh, Jersey, and Karen Border, so, and Whitney from New York. So we have a whole bunch of people logging in. And uh, I, so uh, we have some very nice comments about people who like uh, CTSS. So if you have any questions about the bladder, now's a good time to, to ask. Um, in terms of excretory phase imaging, let me just bring up that point once again. The question is, how much delay do you have with excretory phase imaging? Often you read eight to 10 minutes in the literature. I don't like eight to 10 minutes, and I've said this before. What happens is the contrast gets very dense in the calyces, and then you have lots of beam hardening. It's very easy to, to overlook small tumors. It's very easy to overcall things like papillary necrosis or polynephritis, because everything looks like it's, the attenuation is very much off. So I like about a five minute delay. You get good opacification of the ureter, you get good opacification of the bladder, but it's not too much. It's just not that beam hardening artifact. It allows you to pick up small transitional cell carcinomas. It allows you to pick up lesions of the ureter, lesions of the calyces, lesions of the renal pelvis without any problems. So I think that works out uh, and, and, and works out very, very nicely. So 
I think um, that's a really, really good way of doing it. So looking at bladder protocol, again, 100 to 120 cc's of IV contrast, injected four to five cc's a second. Uh, if it's a patient for hematuria and they're 60 years old, let's pick an example, over 50, non-contrast through the kidneys, arterial phase straight through the kidneys, through the bladder, looking for small tumors, venous phase of the kidneys, and delayed phase at five minutes from the diaphragm down to the symphysis. So again, that maximizes the kidney lesions, ureter lesions, as well as bladder lesions. We don't do supine, we don't do prone. Some people give Lasix, we don't give Lasix. Uh, people always ask, well, what if the ureter is not filled? Do you need to scan again? The answer is no. Ureters have peristalsis, so you may not see filling. I think the thing you need to do is, remember the ureter is kind of like a loop of small bowel in the sense that there's fluid in it. So if you have it opacified a little bit, just follow it down. Look if there's any transition in size. Just be able to follow the ureter in its entirety. You can do that sometimes with coronals or sagittals or obliques. Sometimes the ureters just go in and out, so it's a little bit tricky, short of doing a curved planar. But just follow the ureter. Look for any transitions of thickening, of dilatation, of soft tissue enhancement. Look for anything like that, and I think you're not going to miss any tumors in that regard. Um, a question by Isam, should I have bowel prep to see the fistula? We don't bother with bowel prep. Um, obviously, we do bowel prep if we're doing virtual colonoscopy. But if you say to me, rule out colovesical fistula, we don't do bowel prep. Uh, it's, it's not necessary. You put a small rectal tube in. Uh, we, tr we, again, will inject the contrast by hand uh, with the, the bladder. We don't inject by hand. We do it by gravity. So uh, that works out very well. And those are two really good ways of doing the process. So let's see, I'm at about 17 minutes. So I think I've covered a bunch of the stuff I wanted to go through. If anyone has any questions, it's a good time to ask. But if you don't uh, have any questions, uh, we'll come, we'll, uh, you can email me if you think of things later. There's a good section on CTSS on the bladder. We have all the protocols. They've been updated on the bladder. So I don't think you're going to have much of a problem. In the teaching file, we've put up a bunch of new cases. A bunch of them are on the bladder with fistulae and everything else. So you might want to look at those. And um, let's see. With that, I thank everybody for their attention and hope you have a great day. And we'll see you next time. Okay. Again, if you have any ideas for topics, Lily's been asking. But uh, again, just send us a topic you want us to discuss, and we'd be happy to discuss it. And with that, have a great day.